and understand me? <laughs> we'll see. Um, yeah, thank you ever so much for uh, inviting, for coming to see me, and thank you, Gwen, for inviting me um, to this fabulous library. Um, and it, I wish I were able to stay a little longer here. Um, I'm just here uh, one day. Um, and I didn't bring my winter boots, so I couldn't tramp around and explore, really. I managed to fall over twice, what little I did venture out. Um, so, uh, in 2003, um, I wrote a, a book, uh, or published a book called Tolkien and the Great War, which is published uh, in Britain and the US and in um, Germany, France, Spain, Italy, and China. Um, and it was the product of two years of sort of using up all of my spare time uh, in between a, a newspaper job um, and a further three years of fairly intensive research. Um, and it came from the realization that this author whose works I had been reading since I was nine, in fact, um, although on the face of it, was writing fantasy about elves, which at, who at one time he called fairies, so writing fairy stories, um, had actually experienced the same disillusioning and disenchanting um, horrors of trench warfare that radically changed uh, literature of war um, during the last 100 years. And yet, Tolkien still wrote that fantasy uh, literature. And I wanted to know why. So the book is essentially um, a biographical and literary exploration of those four or five years in close detail. And it, it follows the beginnings of the construction of Middle Earth, because he began it in 1914, just after the war broke out. And the two, I think, are intimately entwined. When it was close to finishing, I made the decision to exclude some of the material that was perhaps less well cooked than the rest. And this material deals with the impact of the war on the Lord of the Rings in particular. It's since been cooked up to standard, I hope. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, what with the centenary of the First World War and the recent climax of the Hobbit movie franchise, it's been a busy time to be an expert on J.R.R. Tolkien and the Great War. And I'm always glad to be able to share my findings and insights, whether it's with hardcore fans or general audiences. The great thing is that Tolkien is such an accessible author. And even those who have not read his books may now have a reasonable idea of what he is about, thanks to the Peter Jackson cinema adaptations. Can we have a show of hands? How many have read The Lord of the Rings? Fabulous. How many have only seen the movies? Okay, you can stay. <laughs> But I should warn you that there will be points where I talk about uh, scenes that are only in the books. And there will be points where there are you know, matters of minor difference between the two. I'm always talking about the books. Uh, there are people who study both, and that's, that's interesting in itself. But it's a different topic, I think. Um, let's see who we're talking about. I should have advanced this already. There we are. So this is Tolkien uh, at Oxford in 1912. He, was, uh, he had just turned 20 at that point. Uh, and he does look young, doesn't he? Um, it not, it's not the, the, the more famous image of Tolkien, this tweedy elderly chap. Um, but this is the, the man who had Middle Earth sort of in embryo, if you like. It took the war to bring it out. Tolkien's Middle-earth books are among the most widely read in the world. Readers from hugely diverse cultures and personal backgrounds enter wholeheartedly into The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. The stories have had this effect since they were published, and there is now no reason to think that they will go out of fashion. You might call their appeal timeless and universal. 
Yet when The Lord of the Rings came out, 10 years after the Second World War, newspaper critics thought it must be a coded, allegorical st story in which Sauron was meant to be Stalin, Saruman Hitler, and the Free Peoples were the Western Allies. In a forward to the second edition in 1965, Tolkien impatiently dismissed such misinterpretations. I imagine J.K. Rowling would feel the same if readers of her Harry Potter books decided Voldemort must be Osama bin Laden, Hogwarts must be NATO, and Dumbledore the President of the United States of America. It's a mistake to try to lock such books inside the narrow box of your own life and times. It's a way to misunderstand them and miss their riches. A coded allegory of the Second World War might be interesting in itself, but would surely not be read just as avidly in 2014 as in 1954 and inspire similar responses in Britain as in Borneo, in the US as in Ukraine. In his 1965 forward to The Lord of the Rings, Tolkien insisted, its sources are things long before in mind or in some cases already written and little or nothing in it was modified by the war that began in 1939. So w what were those sources? Where did Tolkien get his ideas? One answer is medieval literature. The epics of the Anglo-Saxons and other Germanic cultures, such as the stories of Beowulf and Sigurd, the Volsung, that's Wagner's Siegfried. These gave Tolkien the taste for myth and legend, for fairy tale or folk story that shaped his writings. But something else happened when he was first immersing himself in those medieval texts as a student at Oxford something that would rock anyone's foundations and rocked everyone's. The First World War broke out. Today, as we look back on that disaster 100 years later, I hope to show that this had as deep an impact on his imagination as the medieval writings he loved. I think the two were in a kind of dialogue with one another. Would Tolkien have agreed with me? I do think it's difficult, even uncomfortable, for any of us to appreciate how far we are the product of our own times. After all, we cannot look back and survey the era from a later vantage, and we cannot be unbiased. We like to think we're free agents. Meanwhile, Tolkien was a consummate artist who liked to keep his cards close to his chest. When it came to revealing his treasured antechambers, he was as shy as Bilbo Baggins. However, he did once write, I take my models, like anyone else, from such life as I know. And his 1965 forward does more than hint that he recognized the importance of the First World War. After dismissing World War II interpretations as mistaken, he goes on. One has indeed personally to come under the shadow of war to feel fully its oppression. But as the years go by, it seems now often forgotten that to be caught in youth by 1914 was no less hideous an experience than to be involved in 1939 and the following years. By 1918, all but one of my close friends were dead. He could hardly have put it plainer if he had said, don't look at your war for what shaped me and my stories. If you must look at a war, look at my own. The story of Tolkien's friends, incidentally, is a, a key point in my, uh, in, my, in my book. I had the tremendous privilege of uh, being able to read their letters to one another, in which they not only discuss the first Middle-earth writings, but also um, very powerfully uh, you see the, the growth of boys into soldiers, often very suddenly and, uh, and, and sadly. The Lord of the Rings is a, an in, inexhaustibly marvelous book, and there is so much to say about it that it will still be discussed in a hundred years' time or more. But today I want to focus on the experience of the hobbits, and especially Frodo Baggins. I want to show how Tolkien used them to portray a kind of heroism which does not come from the medieval epics he loved to read, but from the modern war he experienced. But first I'll tell you briefly what Tolkien did in the First World War. And I'll also talk a little about what he wrote in the three decades between the beginnings of Middle-earth in 1914 up to The Hobbit, the children's book which unexpectedly turns out to be the breakthrough that let him reconnect 
with his war experience. I'm sure I don't need to remind you that the summer of 1914 was when the war broke out in Europe, though the US wasn't involved until nearly three years later. At the outbreak, all young men in Britain came under intense pressure to join the armed forces, including Tolkien, who was an Oxford undergraduate at the time. Any young man not in military uniform faced abuse in the streets and disapproval even from friends and relatives. But Tolkien was determined that after the war was over, he would begin an academic career. So he stayed on at Oxford until the summer of 1915 when he finished his English degree and, as he put it, bolted into the army. Oh, I think we've... There we are. In the Lancashire Fusiliers Regiment, he trained for a year in England as a second lieutenant, the most junior rank of officer, specialising in signalling. Then in June 1916, he was sent to France to the Western Front, just one of many thousands of soldiers destined to be thrown into the Battle of the Somme, the biggest attempt so far to break the deadlock of the trenches. He was extremely lucky that his own battalion, the 11th Lancashire Fusiliers, was not in the front line on the 1st of July 1916 when the Great of offensive began. It saw the biggest losses in the history of the British Army, with 20,000 dead, including three out of every five officers who were there just one day. The front line hardly moved. A fortnight later, during the taking of the German-held village of Ovile, Tolkien witnessed what he later called the animal horror of active service. As a signals officer, Tolkien was put in command of all communications for the 11th Lancashire Fusiliers while the battalion took several gruelling turns holding the front line. In frozen late October, he ran signals during the taking of another important German position. Trench fever, a louse-borne disease which struck him down straight after that, probably saved his life. His battalion went on to Ypres, but he was sent back to England. You might expect a literate man setting down to write, as Tolkien did in hospital directly after the Somme, to produce something like the brutally realistic prose and verse that we now associate with the First World War. Things like Eric Ray Marks, All Quiet on the Western Front, or in Britain, Anthem for Doomed Youth by Wilfred Owen. The war these men all shared had shattered existing notions of what heroes are and how to write about them. In their writing, soldiers are mostly passive sufferers. Wilfred Owen declared that his poetry was not about heroes. He even said that English poetry was not yet fit to speak of them. Though Owen was killed in the final days of the war, his views were hugely influential in shaping British attitudes to the Great War. And from the 1920s, many people no longer did speak about heroes, as if there were no such thing. However, when Tolkien was writing about the heroic Anglo-Saxon poem Beowulf in 1936, he insisted, even today, despite the critics, you may find men who have heard of heroes and indeed seen them. Instead of brutal realism, Tolkien began constructing his mythology, his grand fairy story of elves, monsters, and magic. Increasingly, as time went by, he explored versions of old-style heroism side by side with new versions that show the impact of the Great War. The first tale set in Middle-earth was written in hospital in the winter of 1916 to 17, so straight after the Somme. A tale of desperate battle between elves and the forces of a tyrannical, mechanical-minded evil. In the following years, he constructed a grand cycle of legends which he eventually called the Silmarillion. And several of its key figures, oh, I'm sorry, this is what I should have shown earlier. That's, that, that's the, um, the village that Tolkien's battalion helped to seize in July 1915. Uh, well, it had been a village. There we are. That's Turin from the uh, Silmarillion and the, the children of Hurin. <laughs> 
several of its key figures, such as Turin, are young men thrust unwillingly into war, as Tolkien himself had been. But they're all epic figures, equal to all but the most outrageous challenges. And so it seems to me that they didn't let Tolkien draw fully on personal experience. None of this was published. The figure who eventually let him reconnect with his own experience of war and who made Tolkien famous was distinctly less than hero-sized, Bilbo Baggins. The Hobbit was originally meant for his own children, John, Michael, Christopher and Priscilla. Tolkien wisely saw they needed a hero more familiar and less remote than the elvish and mortal warriors he'd been writing about in his private mytho mythology. And as people often do when trying to identify with their children, he looked back to his own childhood for inspiration. So he modelled Bilbo and his fellow hobbits directly on English people as he had known them in and around the English country village, Sarah Hole, bottom, bottom left, um, and Rednall shortly afterwards, uh, that, that he lived in as a, as a child near Birmingham. The Shire of the Hobbits, he said, is more or less a Warwickshire village of about the period of the Diamond Jubilee, 1897, when Queen Victoria had been on the throne for 60 years. Bilbo, a figure standing uncertainly at the doorway into adventure, is an engaging mixture of fear and daring, but he learns and grows with astonishing speed until he can look death calmly in the eye. And as he does so, he reflects a transformation Tolkien had seen in real life in the Great War. Indeed, it's only natural that the hobbits so connected with the rural England of Tolkien's youth should respond to terror and danger much as he had seen the men of his own generation respond. The Hobbit is not Tolkien's wartime experience in disguise, but it's easy to see how his memories must have invigorated this tale of a rite of passage past the fearful jaws of death. The well-to-do hero is thrown in with dwarves, proud craftsmen forced to sink as low as blacksmith work or even coal mining, just as Tolkien had marched and fought alongside men of the Lancashire factories and coal fields. Although he was channeling his own experience, let me make clear that the enemies in The Hobbit are not meant to be seen as the German soldiers of 1914 to 18 in fantasy outfits. I stress this point in Dresden. Tolkien didn't have that kind of black and white mind. Evidence shows that although he thought Britain's defense of France and Belgium was morally right, he came to respect the ordinary German soldier as much as the ordinary British one. Instead, the orcs embody the kind of evil Tolkien had seen on both sides on the Western Front in 1916, the evil that puts acquisition, power, and machinery before real people composed of flesh and spirit. In The Hobbit, he says of the orcs, it's not unlikely that they invented some of the machines that have since troubled the world, especially the ingenious devices for killing large numbers of people at once, for wheels and engines and explosions always delighted them. But in those days, that they had not advanced, as it is called, so far. Bilbo and the dwarves approach the end of their quest across the desolation created by Smaug, a dragon who embodies destructive greed. Just like the Western Front, it is a once green land with now neither bush nor tree and only broken and blackened stumps to speak of ones long vanished. Scenes of sudden violent ruin follow. We visit the camps of the sick and wounded and listen to wranglings over matters of command and strategy and all culminates in a battle involving the machine-minded orcs and the elves who, in Tolkien's mythology, represent the aspiration to live and work in sympathy with the natural world. In The Hobbit, the two chief responses to battlefield death, horror and mourning, appear side by side. The orcs lying, piled in heaps till Dale was dark and hideous with their corpses. But among them, many a fair elf that should have lived yet long ages merrily in the wood. So was Tolkien trying to escape from unbearable reality? Yes and no. As he said, fairy stories show or enable a particular kind of escape, the flight of the fugitive, not 
the deserter. His stories help the fugitive reader escape the dehumanizing and denaturing forces that Tolkien saw at their worst in the trenches. But even as we escape, we gaze back at tormented no man's lands and fences of steel. We see Tolkien's experience of war filtered and focused through a prism of metaphor, myth, and medievalism. In The Lord of the Rings, his experience of war was also focused through his children's lives. And here is one way in which the Second World War clearly does have an effect on the sequel to The Hobbit. Written as it was between 1937 and 1948, he admitted that the shadow of the times helped to give the new book its far more adult tone. I would say further that the new war, his son's war, brought back vivid memories of the old war of his own. When he's writing to his sons, he's constantly referring to what he's been through um, and trying to give them comfort from it. I survived. I went through this. You know. With its repeated episodes of horror, danger, and discomfort, combined with exile and the breaking down of old certainties, The Lord of the Rings is often a story of abject fear and pitiful humiliation, far from the heroic pattern. Hobbits are insular, domestic, and prone to petty squabbles, easy to love and lampoon, but difficult to admire and eulogize, a bit like the British. Frodo sometimes wishes an earthquake or dragons would wake up his stupid and dull fellows. Such dissatisfaction with ordinary life was a strong current at the start of the Great War when the English poet Rupert Brooke called his countrymen half-men, spoiled by peace. Tolkien sometimes expressed similar views. Yet war is no more welcome to Frodo Baggins of the peaceful shire than it was in 1940 in England to Tolkien, who described the calamity as the collapse of all my world. Realizing his love of ordinary life too late, Frodo declares, I wish it need not have happened in my time. He is neither an aspiring hero nor a promising one. Like Tolkien in his final undergraduate year, this is a photograph taken about a week before the war broke out. Like Tolkien in his final uh, undergraduate year, a young man with too much imagination, as he later described himself, who knew that he probably faced going to war, Frodo fears exile and danger and dreads his duty. Like the volunteer soldiers of Tolkien's generation, Frodo becomes heroic precisely because he is a little man taking on an outsized burden for the common good and because he discovers unlooked-for endurance and courage. It's in camaraderie that Frodo finds the key to endurance. He and his fellow hobbits, Captain Frodo and Company, as they call themselves, cope with danger and discomfort in much the same way as soldiers. Songs repeatedly enliven the march. You know those poems that people tend to skip. And also they enliven meals and bath time, the soldier's joy. Stoic humor and sometimes sheer lack of imagination help them cut gigantic terrors down to a manageable size, as when Sam Gamgee addresses the demonic spider Shelob, as if challenging a, a surly hobbit to fisticuffs. Now come on, you filth! You've hurt my master, you brute, and you'll pay for it! My Sam Gamgee, Tolkien wrote, is indeed a reflection of the English soldier, of the privates and batmen that I knew in the 1914 war and recognized as so far superior to myself. The relationship between Frodo and Sam closely reflects the hierarchy of the officer and batman or, his, or servant. Officers had a university education and a middle class background. Working class men stayed at the rank of private or at best sergeant. A social gulf divides the literate, leisured Frodo from Sam, formerly his gardener, and now responsible for wake-up calls, cooking, and packing. Through shared adversity, a reticence based on masculinity and class difference breaks down until Sam can take Frodo in his arms and call him Mr. Frodo, my dear. By then, with Frodo worn down by the burden of carrying the malignant ring, 
the hierarchy between the two hobbits is largely inverted. Frodo moves towards a childlike dependency. He presents the problems, Sam the solutions. In the First World War, this process was common. Officers were commissioned by the British Army for class reasons, not because they were proven soldiers or leaders. The privates, corporals, and sergeants often had the age, experience, and wisdom that their official superiors lacked. Tolkien's friend, the Narnia author C.S. Lewis, wrote, I came to pity and reverence the ordinary man, particularly dear Sergeant Ayres. I was a futile officer. They gave commissions too easily then. A puppet moved about by him, and he turned this ridiculous and painful relation into something beautiful. It became to me almost like a father. So that's Lewis talking about his sergeant. With the help of Sam's home, homely chatter, Tolkien even, uh, sorry, Frodo even laughs on the edge of Mordor. Such a sound had not been heard in those places since Sauron came to Middle-earth, Tolkien notes. This is the kind of laughter that the First World War correspondent Philip Gibbs believed acted as an escape from terror, a liberation of the soul by mental explosion from the prison walls of despair and brooding on the Western Front. Um, over dinner, Gwen mentioned a film called The Wipers Times. I don't know if anyone else saw it recently, uh, about a, a newspaper that was printed by a battalion at Ypres, um, which is just wonderfully satirical uh, of the whole military effort and almost Python-esque in its humor. Oh, I seem to have lost my... Uh, oh, no, there we are. From the outset, Frodo is forced almost immediately into urgent haste, and the character characteristic rhythm of his journey is soon established. It has four recurrent stages, an increasingly weary, fearful struggle to move forward, a violent, nightmarish encounter with death or its agents, an escape from danger, and an interlude of rest and recovery. These are, as it's often been pointed out in Tolkienian criticism, the rhythms of the archetypal quest story, but in fact they also match the enforced stages of the soldiering experience in the First World War, the route march, the trenches, relief and rest. On the march, Frodo's companions Aragorn, Legolas and Gimli are blessed with speed and stamina that should be sung in many a hall, as Aomer remarks. They are man, elf and dwarf, heroic figures on the edge of myth. By contrast, subheroic feet grow leaden as the hobbits trudge past the limits of their endurance. They are bowed under their burdens. Like great war soldiers in the Wilfred Owen poem, bent double like old beggars under sacks, knock kneed, drunk with fatigue. The weight of a pack is a physical version of the weight of duty and fate, as is Frodo's special responsibility the ring that grows into a torment to his mind and an almost unbearable burden on the body. A still bigger burden for Frodo is the awareness that the I is looking for him. Oh, it's up already. How did that get there? It was that more than the drag of the ring that made him cower and stoop as he walked. Such an immense power of surveillance has no place in medieval epic nor does it fall into the same 20th century category as 1984's Big Brother. Sauron is not the state jailer, but the military enemy. The eye sweeps the land for movement while airborne observers, his ring wraiths, scrutinize from above. Fear of surveillance became acute during, becomes acute during the passage of the dead marshes, the no man lands, and the gasping pits and poisonous mounds before the Black Gate of Mordor landscapes that Tolkien conceded were influenced by the devastation of the Somme battlefield. The urgent need to hide is pervasive in The Lord of the Rings. The heroes of an old epic could charge into battle with flags flying and horns blowing, and Tolkien allows a taste of this in the Battle of the Pelennor Fields. But in his lifetime, lifetime he saw that spirit die in the trenches. For latter-day heroes and for Frodo, surprise is the key to success, concealment the key to survival. <laughs> 
A great war soldier's toughest, toughest struggle was not against numbers of troops, but against fear and despair. To combat demoralization, a myth sprang up in 1914 that angels had appeared during the British retreat at Mons. I don't know if you can see that in this light. There are figures up in the sky with bows and arrows. The angels had forbidden the enemy from advancing and given the British soldiers the strength to continue. In the Ringwraith Chief, Tolkien produces an anti-angel of Mons. In battle in Middle-earth, this great black horseman, a dark shadow under the moon, brings panic to the men of Gondor. As Boromir says, it was not by numbers that we were defeated. Wounded by the chief Ringwraith's knife, Frodo drifts into a dark dream of listlessness and despair. Much that makes the Ringwraiths unique suggests the mark of Tolkien's war. The shapeless gas helmets of 1916 obscured the wearer's face as effectively as the Black Rider's hoods and likewise caused breath to snuffle and speech to hiss. The Ringwraith's long-drawn wail that culminates in a high piercing note has much in common with the shrill demented choirs of wailing shells described by Wilfred Owen, which arrived with what another trench writer called a screaming shriek. I would suggest that the seed for the flying ring wraiths first arose from memories of the Somme terrors, the biplanes and blimps that watched the battlefield and the artillery shells that battered it. The Times war correspondent describing the Somme on the eve of Tolkien's first action wrote that, in the darkness it seemed as if the heavens above were full of the whistle and flurry of invisible wings from the shells passing overhead. Another soldier wrote that during artillery fire, the air was alive with the rush and flutter of wings. It was ripped by screaming shells. There are also grounds to suspect that Tolkien was influenced by his experience of poison gas as he devised a symbolic shape for battlefield trauma, demoralization, and despair. An invisible black breath is blamed for the demoralization the ring wraiths inflict. Frodo encounters another cloud of fear from the spider Shelob, the enemy of light and beauty, of freedom, hope, imagination, and inspiration, the central impulses of Tolkien's mythology. Elsewhere, a gray vapor flows from the paths of the dead, and a fog surprises Frodo and his fellow hobbits on the Barrow Downs as if a trap was closing about them. Here, in a haunted burial site and a scene not in the movies. Frodo is first cut off from reality by waking nightmare. In the chamber of the ghostly Barrow White, a hand reaches round a corner, walking on its fingers towards the long sword lying across the hobbit's necks. In the strange green light, Frodo shakes off paralysis and hacks at the hand. But at the same moment the sword splintered up to the hilt, there was a shriek and the light vanished. In the dark there was a snarling noise. The scene has none of the healthy, credible consistency Tolkien worked so hard to achieve elsewhere. But it chimes strongly with the disorientation of heavy fever of the kind Tolkien suffered straight after the Somme. And it also captures the chaotic sensations of deep fear and of modern battle. Soldier writers described the immense effort required to move in action. One, watching his unit launch an attack, saw good men staring like persons in a trance across no man's land, their powers of action apparently suspended. Frodo's inability to aid his stricken friends, the leaden pace and the pale green light are particularly reminiscent of Wilfred Owen's description of a gas attack and the sight through green-tinged gas helmet lenses of a gassed soldier. Later in The Lord of the Rings, the view through a gas helmet seems to resurface in another nightmarish encounter with the dead. Frodo glimpses the corpses submerged in the dead marshes as if through some window glazed with grimy glass, like the gas victim in the Owen poem, dim through the misty panes and thick green light as under a green sea. The dead marshes 
embody war's ineffectual and pitiful waste. The submerged warriors are phantasms ascribed to the necromancy of the Dark Lord. However, Tolkien's real world, real world experience, uh, inspiration would be apparent even if he had not acknowledged it. The battlefield dead lingered in soldier's memory, haunting the soldier writer Siegfried Sassoon, even back in England. He saw them crawling towards his hospital bed or lying on the pavement as he walked in London. On the Western Front, the dead were strangely captivating. Charles Carrington, a soldier who was uh, in, in the same division as Tolkien and experienced very similar things, wrote in his memoir of soldiering that on first reaching the Somme, he was guided like a sightseer to a shell hole where bodies lay looking less human than waxworks. I was neither afraid nor unhappy, he wrote, but fascinated. Tolkien embodies such ghoulishness in the skulking, damaged Gollum, who admits he has tried to touch the phantom marsh figures. Sam suspects this is so that he might eat them. Yet morbid fascination seems a more likely reason, considering that Gollum was once captured lurking there, peering in the water as the dark eve fell, covered in green slime. When Sam discovers Frodo half in a trance with his hands dripping slime, we may well wonder whether he has not simply tripped over, my first thought, but has also tried to touch the underwater figures. Tolkien summed up the whole experience of trench warfare in two words, animal horror. And always the miasmic clouds of fear in The Lord of the Rings force people down towards the level of beasts. The ringwraith's cry strikes soldiers so that into their minds a blackness came, and they thought no more of war, but only of hiding and of crawling and of death. One war correspondent described something similar when he said that during battle, soldiers became primitive earthmen like human beasts. He added that though they might wash off the mud and laugh away the horror, the mental scars endured. And it's in such a direction that Frodo travels. The yardstick, the yardstick of his de degradation towards the subhuman is Gollum. We all know what Gollum looks like now. It's one of the really good things about the films, I think, um, the way he's visualized. Uh, and in the book, he's described as moving like a spider, frog, or squirrel. As the trio crawl through the mire, stinking and coated with slime, Sam concludes that they will soon be three precious little golems in a row. In literary terms, Gollum may descend from British water trolls, but a Somme myth that com commanded wide belief among the troops may also have helped to shape him. One soldier's account recalls dire warnings that no one should go alone past a certain point in the trenches for fear of the wild men who lived there underground like ghouls among the mouldering dead and who came out at night to plunder and kill. Another account says these half insane deserters from the armies of both sides would issue pale with a cellar dampness from caves and grottos under certain parts of the front line to rob the dying of their few possessions. In Tolkien's uncharacteristically physical portrayal, Gollum's head is too big for his scrawny neck. He has a lolling tongue and gobbling throat, and his clammy fingers paw and snap. He cackles and sobs in rapid succession, or cringes and flinches as if from unseen blows. All these features bear comparison with depictions of the victims of war trauma, or shell shock as it was known when first observed in thousands of soldiers on the Somme. Excuse me a moment. Also comparable with war trauma are the symptoms increasingly displayed by Frodo. He is struck momentarily blind with terror on hearing the ringwraith's wailing cry during a thunderstorm, a scene that closely evokes the sensory horrors, horrors of an artillery attack. 
It seems a strikingly odd incident in its context, but blindness was one of the varied symptoms of shell shock. In fact, shell shock was less likely to result from a shell blast than from an aggregation of heavy, heavy bombardments and prolonged stretches in the battle zone. Similarly, Frodo's repeated encounters do not inure him to terror and despair, but weaken his resistance. It's only thanks to Sam's dogged companionship that Frodo resists madness, or at least defers it. But when Sam offers to carry his burden, Frodo sees him as a grasping orc. The ring has taken over his perceptions and he starts to show, like a golem in the making, signs of split personality. The parallels between Frodo's condition and shell shock are striking. This is how the Times described the new nervous disorder in 1915. He may be so affected that changes occur in his sense, sense perceptions. He may become blind or deaf or lose the sense of smell or taste. He is cut off from his normal self and the associations that go to make up that self. At night, insomnia troubles him, and such sleep as he gets is full of visions. Past experiences on the battlefield are recalled vividly. The will that can brace a man against fear is lacking. Frodo twitches uncontrollably. His sleep is uneasy, full of dreams of fire. Remembrance of a better life is erased. No taste of food, no feel of water, no sound of wind, no memory of tree or grass or flower, no image of moon or star are left to me, he says. In their place is an intense vision of the ring revealed in all its symbolic power. I am naked in the dark, Sam, and there is no veil between me and the wheel of fire. I begin to see it even with my waking eyes, and all else fades. Yet Frodo's journey is not simply towards degradation. As someone who had survived the Great War, Tolkien was searching for meaning behind the suffering he had witnessed. And he found it in the ennoblement that he perceived in his fellow soldiers. Towards the end of his quest, Frodo is increasingly Christ-like. He expects to die saving the world. He abandons his weapons and refuses to fight. None of this is to say that Tolkien meant Frodo to represent Christ. In First World War writings, the comparison of suffering, self-sacrificial soldiers to Christ is quite routine. As the great historian and cultural commentator Paul Fussell says, it was hard not to see Christ as a fellow, fellow sufferer, especially when he hung on so many French roadside calvaries. And when the standard British Army field punishment happened to evoke crucifixion, I've actually spared you the full picture here because in the foreground are several corpses. Um, the, yeah, the standard British Army field punishment happened to evoke crucifixion. This punishment is one that Tolkien would certainly have seen. The device of torment was not a cross, but the wheel of an artillery piece upon which the soldier would be spread-eagled for hours. I wonder whether Frodo's wheel of fire is a recollection of this. But it also suggests the wheels and furnaces of industry. The ring is no mere magic trinket or party trick, but rather a device for magnifying power and achieving domination. Symbolically, it's the arch machine. Though Frodo never sees a major battle, it's fitting that carrying this symbol of the evils that Tolkien saw at the root, uh, saw at their worst in the mechanized First World War, he should undergo the psychological traumas that soldiers suffered then, and that his progress should parallel what Tolkien had seen in them, the ennoblement of the ignoble through hardship and fear. On Mount Doom, Frodo does not die. Nor, though he tries to claim the ring of power as his own, does he acquire superpowers. Instead, he sees the ring taken from him and destroyed against his will. And then we observe his delayed breakdown. As Tolkien commented in one letter to a fan, he thought that he had given his life in sacrifice. He expected to die very soon, but he did not, and one can observe the disquiet growing in him. This is a tale written with the survivor's insight into the sorrows that outlive war. The first sign of scarring is physical. 
his missing ring finger bitten off by Gollum. Like the hero Beren's loss of a hand in one of the lost tales written during or straight after Tolkien's own war, this became the Silmarillion, Frodo's amputation matches real experience. To the Great War generation, it was hard to avoid equating general victory with individual loss, often bodily. More than a quarter of a million Britons were wounded in a limb, 41,000 of them to the point of amputation. In Frodo, this loss also matches a personal loss of integrity. He actually regrets the destruction of the malign ring of power. This is not the kind of thing that heroes are supposed to feel. Yet the reality of the First World War shows through. The ring magnifies the self-same evils that fueled that war, paranoia, desire for strength, fantasies of heroism. And Frodo's regret echoes the most surprising sorrow to, bef to befall demobbed soldiers, grief that the war was over. War had brought simplicity, clarity, intensity, and the chance to be a hero. Homecoming and armistice brought disillusionment, confusion, purposelessness, and the breaking of fellowships. Civilians, on the other hand, could not comprehend the reality of the trenches, but clung instead to an antiquated idea of war as a kind of glorified game. Soldiers who cut a great dash, like Merry and Pippin, when they get back home to the Shire, might be treated as heroes. But soldiers who were maimed in body or spirit were very likely to be patronized or ignored. During the final chapters of The Lord of the Rings, when helping to purge the Shire of the machine-minded profiteers who have taken it over in his absence, I think I've fallen behind again here, amputees. No, missing, missing picture, I'm sorry. Um, so there's a chapter for the benefit of movie-only people in, in, the, uh, in the Lord of the Rings book uh, called the, Ke the Scouring of the Shire, where the hobbits return and find that the Shire has been overtaken um, by Saruman, who's turned it into a dictatorship um, and is trying to screw as much money out of it as possible through industry. And during these chapters, Frodo intervenes only to save lives and remonstrate against violence. Thus, in the end, his desire for peace, learned through the hard lesson of war, helps to cheat him of the honor he craves. This is a sharp irony, one that perhaps only a soldier of the war to end all wars could fully appreciate, particularly a soldier such as Siegfried Sassoon, who was treated in a mental hospital because he had publicly denounced the war. At the end of The Lord of the Rings, Tolkien shows both sides of the coin. Those whose story has been epic enjoy honor, but Frodo, whose journey has been a psychological nightmare, suffers neglect. At the close of the First World War, the simple illusions of heroic victory were replaced with dour and complex reality. Those who had fought were irreversibly changed. Frodo's consolatory view, as a misfit like many who returned from war, remains filled with personal pain. I have been too deeply hurt, he says. I tried to save the Shire, and it has been saved, but not for me. It must often be so, Sam, when things are in danger, someone has to give them up, lose them, so that others may keep them. A final factor in Frodo, Frodo's breakdown is what Tolkien in a later commentary called unreasoning self-reproach. He saw himself and all that he had done as a broken failure. The ring is gone despite his final efforts while the world is not wholly mended. In more general terms, Frodo may voice Tolkien's feelings as an officer invalided at home while his Lancashire Fusiliers battalion was ultimately destroyed. Siegfried Sassoon's war, and there he is, also ended with a bullet wound for glancing over the trench parapet. But Sassoon might have been describing Frodo's state of mind in his fictionalized autobiography, Memoirs of an Infantry Officer. Inwardly, I was restless and overwrought. My war had stopped, but its after effects were still with me. I couldn't sleep. My thoughts couldn't escape from themselves into that completed peace 
which was the only thing I wanted. I saw myself as one who had achieved nothing except an idiotic anticlimax, and my mind worked itself into a tantrum of self-disparagement. Frodo's lasting desire is just such a completed piece. Where shall I find rest, he asks. The answer is Tolkien's one piece of wish fulfillment. His wounded hero is taken by enchanted ship to the lonely Isle of the Elves, like King Arthur being taken to Avalon. Now that his journey into enemy territory is over, Frodo finally earns something akin to the fairy story flight from reality that Tolkien had so far avoided. Yet, this voyage to the Lonely Isle, a place he had originally conceived during the First World War as a sort of half-paradise Lost Tales version of England, is a characteristic Tolkienian flourish. In 1916, the hospital ship Asturias had carried Tolkien back from France in fever, ready to begin his mythology. Back to the Lonely Isle. In this way, as he lets the curtain fall at the end of Frodo's story in The Lord of the Rings, the faint image of his own voyage home from the Somme may be discerned. The undeniable poignancy of the image resides, paradoxically, in our very knowledge that such completed peace is impossible on the hither shore of life. Perhaps Tolkien's mythology was a necessary expression of feelings that could otherwise find no outlet, a cathartic release for his own war trauma, however deep that went. We don't know. Though superficially different from contemporary war literature, it is just as much an attempt to make sense of life and death as witnessed in the crucible of the trenches. And taken all in all, as I hope I have shown, these various likenesses between Frodo's and Tolkien's experiences of war allow us to see why the Lord of the Rings strikes such a true chord even now when the long shadow of the Great War still haunts us. Thank you. Tolkien's uh, sons caught up in World War II? Yes, uh, three sons. The elder was in training for the priest, so he was exempt. Sorry, did everyone hear? The, everyone heard the question, didn't they? Uh, so Tol Tolkien had three sons. The eldest, John, was in training for the priesthood when the war broke out, so he was uh, exempt from war service. Um, the second son, Michael, um, was first of all an anti-aircraft gunner, during the Blitz, and then he became a, a gunner in, a, in, in bombers over Germany. In the, he was a tail gunner. And um, by 1944, uh, he was at home being treated for, for war trauma. He was, uh, his father described him as a, a much damaged soldier. Um, and at that same point, the youngest son, Christopher, um, was sent off to South Africa to train to be a Spitfire pilot. Um, so you can imagine the torment that Tolkien would have been in at that point of time. Uh, it was at that very point that he was writing that, that chapter about the dead marshes and so on. Hillary, Hillary Tolkien. Um, well, Hillary Tolkien did not. Um, hesitate to join up. He joined up um, in, in uh, August or September 1914 in one of the battalions that was being raised, volunteers in Birmingham where they came from. Um, and he, he went all over the place during the First World War um, and was uh, wounded twice, um, but sent back, which was fairly routine. Um, Tolkien was, his, the elder Tolkien was really fortunate in his uh, trench fever in the sense that a, it didn't kill him, um, and B, it kept him out of the war, uh, out, of, out of trench warfare at least, uh, for, the, for the duration. Um, he was back in Britain uh, training soldiers and um, helping to guard the coast, basically. Um, but yeah, Hillary's experience, I, Hillary, Hillary's much more Hobbit-like than J.R.R. <laughs> 
um, he became a fruit farmer. Um, and, uh, and I'm sure that, that he probably helped his brother uh, stay attuned with reality quite a lot. <laughs> there, were, there were planes involved. Um, what, 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 what else? Um, so I, I give talks from time to time. Uh, I have a website. People find out about my book. Um, and what happens is, as Gwen was explaining to me, at the moment, institutions like this are providing educational programs of interest about the First World War. And Tolkien is a really accessible way of drawing people in to the First World War, and also a fairly unusual one. Um, when I wrote my book, I was aware that there were, there were a few books about Tolkien, or there, let me put it another way, there were very few books about Tolkien that did not mention that he'd been in the First World War, but none had examined it. Um, and to the general public, there was no real sense of a connection there. Um, now, I'm very proud to say that, that it's reached the point where when the BBC makes a documentary about soldier poets on the Somme, as they did last November, they invited me to go and over to the Somme and talk about Tolkien's experiences there. So it sort of opened up the idea of what a war writer could be. You had another question? Yeah, well, uh, are any of Tolkien's descendants still living? Yes. Uh, his daughter Priscilla, um, who has no children, um, and his son Christopher, the aforementioned Spitfire pilot trainee, um, who has been editing and publishing books by his father um, ever since his father died. So they now outnumber books published during his lifetime by three to one, I think, something like that. Um, and that, but it's wonderful. It's wonderful stuff, and really has enriched understanding of Tolkien. Now, there's another question at the back. Yeah, how difficult was it for me to get access to the, to the letters I was talking about? Very. Um, when I when I started writing the book, um, I. I wrote asking for access and it was refused. Um, later on, I had uh, the, the, the wonderful um, joy of being given a, 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 a publishing contract by HarperCollins, who are Tolkien's publishers in Britain. Um, and they have inevitably a relationship with the Tolkien estate. That's basically Christopher and Priscilla and the family. Um, and they decide, that's, that's, not, that's the wrong way of putting it, they have a say-so in what HarperCollins can publish on Tolkien. So I had to have their approval even to write the book. And therefore, having gone that far, they allowed me to look at certain pertinent materials from his private papers that are held at the Bodleian Library in Oxford. Um, so I looked at all the papers relating specifically to his war service, which are not many, um, and more, much more richly, this body of letters between the four friends uh, who, who had met at school um, and were each sent to their relative battlefronts, and of whom only, only two survived. Over here. Did, did Tolkien go senile towards the end of his life? I don't think I've heard those rumors. Um, so I, do, I don't think those are true. Um, and I'd be interested to, I'll, I'll, I'll Google that one. Uh, <laughs> because it's kind of the, uh, you know, need, probably needs to be debunked. What, what fa famously did happen is that he was expected and was hoping to complete the Silmarillion, which was really the, 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 the book he started uh, in 1916. Um, that he'd never completed, and he, he kept revising all through his life. Uh, it became such a massive project 
it's, it's, it really is a, a created world and complex mythology with language, invented languages, um, invented cultures, all kinds of facets, um, which would need a committee, an army of, of writers to, to produce to the full. Tolkien was trying to do it single-handedly. And I think that what happened was, by the time he had finished The Lord of the Rings and made a first push to get the Silmarillion finished um, and brought himself to retirement age, he was actually exhausted. And he never had the same fire in him that he'd had up to that point. Um, so uh, very sadly, um, the, the Silmarillion, parts of it were, were pushed to a, a, a great level of artistry and completeness, but only parts of it. So ultimately what we have is, is an edition edited by his son Christopher um, from multiple texts from different stages that have had to be brought into um, coherence with one another. Yeah. Was that was I a, a Tolkien scholar or a First War, World War scholar first? Uh, I wasn't a scholar. I was a journalist. <laughs> um, uh, I I read The Lord of the Rings when I was nine. Um, so you can imagine at that very impressionable age, it helped to build who I am. Um, and I remember my English teacher when I was 12 introducing me to the war poetry of Wilfred Owen and saying, Look, this is real poetry, never mind that Tolkien rubbish. You know? um, and I was you know, a little riled by that. Um, and that really set the tone. I actually love Wilfred Owen's poetry. It's, it's phenomenal. Um, and it, it awoke my love of a, a wide, much wider range of poetry. But I went on to study English literature at Oxford myself. Um, and there, although Tolkien had taught there, he was a bit of a, a stranger in his own homeland. Um, people in the 1980s tended to scoff at him. Um, far more, I think, in Britain than they, they have done in the US. Um, and it took me quite some years after that to, to um, overcome the sense that, well, I, perhaps he's just a bit of a B-grade writer. Um, but finally, I, I, I read a book called The Road to Middle-Earth by Tom Shippey, which I recommend to anyone who's interested in understanding Tolkien in a, a broader sense, and his, his background as a philologist, of, studying the interrelationships between languages and literatures of the medieval uh, European world. Um, and that gave me the confidence uh, to, to look afresh at Tolkien. Um, so I reached a point where I was doing some really nerdy, nerdy, the nerdiest of nerdy work on Tolkien. I was trying to, to construct an elvish dictionary, um, which is much more complicated than you can imagine because Tolkien kept revising Elvish, or uh, the various Elvishes, throughout his lifetime. So I needed to catalogue the texts in which he did this and try to put them in a chronology. And I noted, in, in looking at them extremely closely and looking at the circumstances in which they were written, that's when I realised, gosh, he was writing these things when he was in training camps. And at the same time, I was reading novels set in the First World War, Birdsong by Sebastian Falks, uh, Regeneration by ba Pat Barker. Um, and, and it really acutely uh, made me want to go and find out more. Someone was waving a hand up over here, yes. What I, I was trying to be extremely completist and, and, and thorough, um, and this is my approach to things. Um, so it, it was simply meant to catalogue um, all instances of elvish, dwarvish, Quenya, Sindarin, their predecessors earlier on in Tolkien's mythology, um, and so on. You know, There's loads of the stuff. I, I'm glad I found something more interesting to do because I'm not a born, I'm not a born uh, lexicographer. <laughs>